I'm, I mean, I'm the inward judge. <laughs> We're waiting for one. <laughs> Good morning. Yes. It's terrific to see you all. Um, I am, we'll give it a few more minutes before we start, but it would be great if uh, you all just sort of briefly uh, gave your names and uh, tell us how you feel this morning. Are you excited? Yes, very excited. excited. <laughs> it's not morning actually here. Uh, you know, we're in the uh, Asia Europe side of the world. So this is like in the middle of the day and Ooh. we feel really excited. <laughs> um, delighted to have you here. Um, Thank you. Michael? Yes. You are a judge, correct? Yes. Terrific. Welcome. Delighted you. that, that you're here. And Fred, you're also here, Fred Kipperman. Yes. Good. Uh, good morning from Los Angeles. Uh, terrific. So it would be great if uh, you all uh, gave us a sense of, of, you know, anything you want to tell us about yourselves before we start. We would love to know more about you. Let well, before you be, before you do that, I'd like to jump in just and say hello. Of course, I'm hi, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom White. Um, I just wanted to make sure, let's see, everyone is here. So, and Michael, good, uh, did that all, that all work out. You have, you have the link and welcome to the team. Uh, you're, uh, I think from, you're certainly one of the most distant teams that we have. So very happy to see you all. Um, I'll just, I, so that I just want to pop in, say hello. Thank everyone for being here. This is our 24th event. Um, the, your, your school has been here for a number of years. We we're thrilled about that. It's great to see Summer again. Uh, Fred, uh, Fred and I used to live in the same part of the world, but Fred, thanks very much for, for coming back again. Um, okay. the, the, um, so as far as a couple of things to the teams, um, you will be getting in the course of the day some um, links for tomorrow. Um, the links are separate for the morning and the afternoon. So you'll be getting those, keep an eye out on those. Uh, you'll also be getting a couple of memos in the course of the day. So please take a look at the, make sure you take a look at those. Um, the re, for the results, we're gonna have, we'll announce the results at um, a webinar on noon on Monday, noon Eastern time in the States. So we'll send you some information about that. The, um, otherwise you all are, are veterans, so I don't have to say much else, but uh, thanks again. Um, uh, Sabrina is uh, is here as the uh, tech person, and Gail is the Uber judge. So I will not uh, delay things any further. But and when I uh, when I when I leave, hopefully it will not uh, disrupt the entire the entire webinar. So thanks again. Thanks Fred. Thanks uh, thanks Michael. Um, really appreciate uh, all your help, Samra. Thanks for the getting the team together again. And I will put you in the capable hands of uh, of Gail and Sabrina. Thanks very much, Tom. Well, officially welcome. Um, I've had an opportunity to hear um, the Middle East Technical University's presentations over the years, so it's a delight to have an opportunity to be the uh, to be the, the Uber judge today to to hear you again. How terrific! I'm Gail O'Brien. I've been involved with IBEC for probably over ten years. It's a wonderful program, and I'm, uh, I'm an executive coach, and I work in leadership, culture, and ethics, and it's a delight to introduce to you our two judges who will tell you a little bit about themselves so you know who you're talking to, mm -hmm. although you've given us a very different role, but it always helps to know who we really are. Michael, would you like to go first? Sure. My name is Michael McMillan. I'm the Director of Ethics and Professional Standards at CFA Institute. And as a matter of fact, we also hold a CFA Ethics Challenge um, at the Institute. But in, that, in this case, um, the ethics focuses upon ethical issues and dilemmas in the investment field. So it's nice to hear and talk about ethical issues outside of investing. Terrific, thank you. And Fred Kipperman. 
Sure. Good morning. Uh, really, I mean, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's uh, inspirational to be part of uh, programs like this, and I, I love the international component. Mm -hmm. My background is in law, and uh, I worked for a while at the Rand Corporation where I met Gail, and we studied some issues around uh, corporate ethics and governance, and it just sensitized me to the importance. Uh, and since then, I've really enjoyed trying to, to pay attention and be a part of the community. And, and this is one of the ways that I'm able to do it. Thanks. I deeply appreciate both uh, Michael and, and Fred for being here. I also appreciate the fact that you all followed directions and you told us who our role is, which is very important. We're going to be Waymo's board of directors and you're going to be Waymo's ethics support team. And that's great to know from the outset. I need to be a timekeeper as each of you will be um, for your presentation. At, as you know, you've got uh, 20 to 25 minutes and you've got a five minute uh, cushion after that, but I will have to step in and shut things off at, at 30 minutes if you're not done. So. That's just part of the rules, wanted to let you know that. Uh, you all know what you've been preparing for weeks and months, but I need to read to you uh, what it is we're doing in this full presentation, just for everyone's clarification. So forgive the repetitiveness. In this part of the competition, you're taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are, which you did, and who they are before you begin. You'll have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all accounts. During this time, the team will be uninterrupted. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 20 minutes. And during the Q&A, the judges and the Uber judge are going to be the role that you've given us. After the Q&A, we're gonna give you feedback as ourselves. And it's designed to help you with the next 10 or the, the 90 second. It's designed to just let you know, because you've worked so hard, just give you feedback on that. Um, the ethical aspects of the role playing are especially important. Some things to consider. It helps if you, you know, don't have it so far away that you couldn't possibly read it. Um, however, you sh however, these should be described in simple, practical, common sense fashion. Using technical philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religion or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. During this presentation, every member of the team must have a speaking role. Any questions? Um, no, thank you. Not a question, but a thanks to you giving this chance for us to be in an international yeah. competition. It's, it's really great and we appreciate it. And Oh, and, and we've just been joined by another, uh, by another judge. Um, Tom, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Yes, uh, my name is Tom Dowd. Uh, I've been a judge for uh, a few years now. And uh, believe it or not, I have a history with uh, Tom White. He and I and my wife were high school classmates back. Oh, wow. Day. Yeah, it was, they were still uh, good friends. Um, I'm a retired business executive. Uh, I worked in the healthcare industry. And, and then after 25 years, got into teaching and really enjoyed that. And now uh, I'm retired and here I am. Happy to be here. That's terrific. And Tom, just so that uh, I'm just clarifying uh, when, we, when this starts, uh, we are all uh, on the Waymo board of directors. Mm -hmm. That's our role. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And it would be great to take um, a minute so that all of the judges have a chance to know who, who um, uh, Rabbi and um, Nurpari are. So if you wanna just take a little bit of time just to say who you are, what you're, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing at school, it would be great to get oriented with, uh, you know, with, with that. Thank you. 
My name is Rabia. I'm a senior student at uh, Middle East Technical University Business Administration Department. And is everything okay with my voice and uh, appearance video? Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I've been debating for like seven years, and this is a really great experience to test myself. And Nurperi, my teammate, uh, you can introduce yourself. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you once again for having us over today. And my name is Nurperi Demirova. I'm an international student, uh, also studying business administration at Middle East Technical University in Turkey. And I'm particularly interested in the field of AI ethics which is what we're going to talk about today. And we really hope that you'll get to enjoy it as well. Terrific. Thank you very much. All right. Shall we set our times collectively? Uh, are you and ready to I'm, be? Yeah, I'm going to be sharing the presentation. Yes, just to make sure that there's not going to be any problem with the. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. OK. What we're going to do is uh, when you start, I will start the timer. Mm -hmm. I'm just sharing the presentation. Yes, just a second. You see it, right? We do. Yes. Great. Good. OK, great. So if you'd like, we can start. Please let us know if you put the timers. Can we start now? Yes, and you have your own timer going, right? Okay, thank you. Right. Let's uh, go. Today, uh, my name is Nurper Demirva and I'm here with my amazing colleague, Rabia Akchai. And today we're going to represent an ethics support team at Waymo. And we're gonna talk about the emergent issues raised by this new self-driving technology from legal, financial, and ethical perspectives. And we're gonna deliver you, our board of directors at Waymo, a constructive solution that addresses each of those dimensions. Let's first start with our outline so you have a better idea of what this presentation will cover up today. We'll first talk about what kind of self-driving technology we're talking about in particular. Then we're gonna talk about the current challenges faced by the self-driving technology. We'll move on to the legal, financial, and ethical aspects. We'll also have a constructive solution delivered to you and a Q&A section at the very end. Let's first start with the definition. What, are we, what kind of technology are we talking about here? Well, here we're talking about a self-driving car, also referred to as an autonomous car, which is a vehicle that uses a combination of sensors, cameras, radars, and artificial intelligence, machine learning in <coughs> particular, to travel between destinations without a human operator. In this case, please keep in mind to qualify as fully autonomous, a vehicle must be able to navigate to a predetermined destination without human intervention. So in this slide, you can see this is how the actual autonomous car looks like. You can see that there are cameras, radar sensors, additional leader units that send the information to the central AI system, the main computer and truck, and the main leader units at the very top. Please keep this image of the autonomous car in mind as we address the issue surrounding these cars uh, in this presentation. Now let's talk about what are the current challenges faced by this amazing technology. Uh, unfortunately, there are some concerns of ours that might cause some problems. So here, in order to understand that, we need to first understand the level of technology we are targeting from the level zero to level five, from the traditional human driver to the fully autonom automated cars. We have five levels of autonomy. And in the first uh, three levels, we basically, uh, the car, uh, this technology providers provide the uh, driving assistance uh, to provide better security safety standards. In the level four and level five, the car color a little bit changes and the riskiness a little bit increases because the human intervention decreases, the car controls itself. And in the fifth level, you don't even need a driver on the seat. But in the fourth level, where we, as Waymo, uh, where we are, uh, is there a problem here? No, uh, in the fourth level, we have the driver on the seat should be tracking the road conditions, but uh, the car does all the job itself. So the driver need to decide here, as you can see, uh, it is suitable in certain circumstances. Driver should be able to decide if that circum certain circumstances are met 
which creates a concern here. We, if we are concerned, if the drivers are capable of making that decision, if the, those uh, circumstances are met. So here you see an actual picture of the car with all of its sensor and cameras in the level for autonomy. So what might be specifically those challenges could be? Uh, first, and the main concern of ours is safety and privacy. So we are concerned that our uh, technology might not be safe enough to carry human lives. It can be dangerous. And we are collecting a huge data, personal data from our customers that uh, we might sometimes invade their privacy that we should be careful about. And there is the liability issue. Who is held liable in case of an accident? So this is a very uh, multidimensional, a complicated issue because the government, the the, the states, the driver, us, we all have impact on uh, the decision of this, uh, the, uh, uh, these accidents because the government allows it, the driver uses the car, but we produce the technology. So who, who will be held responsible in accident situations? And the problem of moral uncertainty, we human beings in our daily lives, we make some uh, choices about morality in uh, some moral choices, but we might sometimes be indecisive about those choices. We can be in between of doing something, picking uh, in between options, but artificial intelligence makes predetermined choices. And viable business model, we mean viable here with a sustainable, financially and ethically sustainable business we are talking about. We want to be responsible to our society, but if you are able to sustain it financially. An issue of scalability. So as a car technology producer, we cannot just sell it in USA, right? But if we are able to increase our scale to other countries, that is also another concern because uh, there are some um, uh, issues that can be an obstacle in, uh, in, uh, in front of the scalability. So uh, we will approach from three main dimensions, legal, financial, and ethical. Beginning with uh, one of the most important ones, legal dimension, we need to first uh, understand how the legal environment is today. So driverless tests are not allowed in traffic. So the driver must be sitting, sitting on the driver's seat. Although the car drives itself, there must be a human person in there. In all of the, uh, in all of the world, this is valid. And there are inconsistencies between states or countries in terms of legal decisions. And this causes difficulties in court decisions. What we mean by this is the society is discussing this or the states or the, uh, or the lawmakers, this issue is discussed. This issue is the people didn't make its mind, legal system didn't make its mind on this issue. So it makes the court decisions, the laws, legal and inconsistent between even in between the uh, laws in USA states, there are differences. So some states allow public road access, some don't. So uh, this causes inconsistencies and um, a vagueness about who will be penalized. And artificial intelligence, which is really important for legal system, doesn't have conscience, feelings, empathy, or uh, the legal system do not have a preventive effect on uh, artificial intelligence. The preventive impact here means in the criminal uh, law, the, this cr crime, uh, when you make, when you are in, in, included in a crime and you uh, are criminal, you will be penalized, right? As a human being, you will be afraid of that. You will be afraid of putting, being put into a jail. So that makes you like, that prevents you sometimes uh, being, be, doing a crime, but artificial intelligence cannot have this fear or artificial intelligence cannot have an empathy with a human being with a pedestrian so it cannot understand how how pain is like so this is uh, making making its autonomy a suspicious autonomy without feelings we cannot count as a full autonomy although we call it autonomy and here this creates this puts a bigger responsibility in our shoulders because it is not a totally rational choice and the legal system cannot detect who is uh, actually uh, guilty in the accidents. So it's our responsibility who are the creators of this technology. 
And here you see a map of accessibility of public roads to the tests. This is even just to tests. Yeah, we're not uh, here talking about the actual drives, but uh, but as you can see, we are really restricted on some areas in terms of making our tests. For instance, in Phoenix, Arizona and California, we are making conducting our tests now, but it might not reflect the world, world population. We, we cannot just uh, trust on these tests results and then launch our car in different places because the number of tests is limited and the the type of test is actually uh, inadequate because we are not seeing all the dimensions that might occur in traffic. We are just seeing California and Arizona type of places, but the other parts of the other cities in the world might not be this stable, uh, might not be uh, similar to these conditions. So uh, this brings a concern as well. Here, we need to understand the financial structure of our company to go further. Let's start with first the fact that Waymo's annual costs are about $1 billion, whereas its taxi business called Waymo One generates only hundred thousands of dollars per year. You can see that this clearly does not compensate for all the costs that Waymo as a business is incurring. Another point is this might be due to the fact that taxis are most commonly used in urban areas and urban areas are very challenging driving environments. So in this case, and if you think about the target segment of the taxis, it's mainly people who need to quickly catch a cab to get somewhere, to get to different places. So those people are in a rush, in a hurry. So in this case, a self-cautious autonomous car might not be really popular among those customers. Another idea was suggested by Waymo's CEO, or who is about to step down from his position, unfortunately, John Kraftchik. And he suggested a subscription service where Waymo cars will be used as personal vehicles, and then be returned for ride hailing again. Unfortunately, this idea was not commercialized, which may signal that this is a less likely business model. Another important point is that independent startups like Waymo are actually living on borrowed time. The autonomous cars were promised to be out on the roads by 2021. However, Tesla, Waymo, and Cruise had to change their aggressive timelines and reset their goals because there is a stretch timeline for self-driving technology which is a red flag for investors, right? The fundraisings becomes an area of concern. However, for Waymo, Waymo has a choice in this case. Let's touch upon an issue of ethics a little bit. If you think about it, Waymo has a choice of incorporating ethics by design, which means basically incorporating ethics in all stages, throughout all stages of developing and implementing the AI systems. That way, Waymo will be able to attract external ethical investment funds, which may be able to act as a control on Waymo and enhance its stance within the AI ethics and help Waymo and guide it through the ethical decision-making. The truth is, socially responsible companies have the upper hand in a society. Another important issue, as we, since we started talking about ethics, is the problem of moral uncertainty. Well, do, what do we mean by moral uncertainty? Well, uh, an agent is morally uncertain if he or she has an access to all non-moral facts, including but not limited to empirical and legal facts, but is still not sure of what is expected of him or her in that particular situation. Let's bring an example of a hypothetical situation. Let's say we are, in dri we are driving inside of an autonomous car behind a large truck, which carries heavy objects on a highway. On the right-hand side, we have a motorcycle. On the left-hand side, we have a conventional SUV with a family inside. Let's assume that there is a heavy object falling off that truck and about to crash into us. What options do we have? We have three different options in this case. One of them is swerve to the right and crash into the motorcycle. Second is crash into the object and sacrifice our lives as passengers of the autonomous car. Left one is swerve to the left, left and sacrifice the family's life in that car. These issues of problem uncertainty, who should make the decision and which decision is actually ethically justified? In order to answer that question, we should take into account the cultural differences in ethics. According to the study carried out by the MIT, Eastern cultures tend to be more collectivistic, which basically means that they put greater emphasis on traditions, shared cultural values and customs. They pay high respect to the elderly and pay respect to the society and status. Whereas on the other hand, we have Western cultures, which tend to be more individualistic and they put greater emphasis on self-reliance, assertiveness, independence. So you see that considering the fact that these cultures are not homogeneous and that there is just a chance of outliers, 
we should take into account this cultural bias whenever we are developing an AI algorithm, an AI decision making within the ethical perspective. Another important point to answer that question, the question of who decides to do what in this case, is the fact that ethics are relative. Let's imagine that the programmer cannot make a decision on the basis of objective reasons because his or her doxastic state is already plagued with moral uncertainty, right? In this case, the programmer might rely on his own representation of moral view, his or her own representation of the objective should. So here, the additional framework that includes those uncertain normative beliefs might be able to assist the person in making a more rational choice in this case. In this case, we really should be asking two important questions. Who gets to determine whom to save and whom to kill? And how is the decision-making process going to be evaluated? Another important aspect, uh, let me bring you another example to describe what we're talking about here in particular. Let's imagine right now we're inside, we're sitting in an autonomous car, driving in a narrow road alongside a cliff. A school bus with 28 children suddenly appears around the corner, partially in our lane. And our autonomous car calculates that the crash is inevitable. What should the autonomous car do? Well, in this case, we have two options, swerve to the right and drive off the cliff, sacrificing our lives, or swerve to the left and crash into the school bus, sacrificing the 28 other lives. In this case, no matter what decision the autonomous car makes, it directly interferes with one of the most fundamental human rights, which is a right to life. The AL algorithm, if you think about it, it really resembles the target algorithm used in military services for target selection, right? The crash optimization algorithm, unfortunately, has a tendency to favor or systematically discriminate against the particular object to crash into. Here, not harming them or not killing them is not enough. We need to ensure there's passenger safety and safety of the people around us. A safety is one of our core values at Waymo. Now, if you think about it, it is one thing if we're willingly making that choice of sacrificing ourselves. However, it's a completely different matter if an autonomous car makes that decision for you without your consent and without letting you know that self-sacrifice was even a possibility. So in this case, we're talking about a right to be informed about that particular feature in the car, a right to be informed that this is not a bug in the system, a right to be informed about the decision-making process of the AI algorithm within the car. So here we're touching upon two important points, consent and transparency. It's really about setting the accurate expectations with users and the general public that will have a direct impact on the adoption rate of this technology. So in this case, transparency to ensure the procedural justice is an important part of doing ethics. Giving people simply the answers to their questions will not be enough. Now we're gonna move on to another great challenge, which is product liability and safety. So here with product liability and safety, we mean that uh, if, while designing this product, while uh, there's a, okay. And while designing, creating this technology, we're actually responsible from the outcomes of uh, the accidents or what happens in traffic, the decisions made by artificial intelligence. So we need to be sure that it is safe enough to carry lives. Uh, here, uh, the, one of our biggest concern is data security and privacy, because as I said, we collect a huge data and a personal data, which roads people prefer, which destinations they go, which gas station they buy their gas from. So we need to protect those data from attacks, or we need to be sure that we don't share it with third parties without the consent of our customers, because it's their right to privacy. And we need to eliminate all negligence. We need to consider every uh, poss possibilities in traffic. We need to consider each extreme situation. We need to test our car as much as possible. This is our main uh, responsibility to provide safety standards. And this is one of the uh, most common uh, mistakes or dangers that can happen in, uh, with our technology, possible misuse. We actually, we, we actually observe people uh, who misuse the car, which we mean by they can sleep on the, the driver's seat. They can uh, talk with other passengers. They can read something or watch a movie, but they need to be tracking the road because the technology is not 
ready enough to just hand, uh, to take the whole control of the car. As we mentioned in this level of technology, the driver gives the control under some circumstances. And most of the launched and sold cars have the warnings to uh, warn the driver to be awake and have the control. But this is not the case all the time. I, I see videos of people who put their slippers on the pedals, gas pedal, to cheat the car that uh, she's sleeping on the driver's seat, but they don't actually but they need to be this is legally obligatory and this is required for safety in this level of technology but people misuse it and artificial intelligence lacks human reflexes, such as eye contact. So uh, eye contact is one of the most important things in the traffic. When you come to a crossroad, you look into the other uh, guy's uh, eyes and you decide who will pass. You can like make handshakes or like moves. You can uh, communicate with your face expressions, right? But artificial intelligence do not have that. Or in uh, like, if I, as a human driver, if I see a ball rolling in the middle of the road, although I can pass nearby, I just slow down because I, I can think that based on my whole life experience, I can imagine a child will, could be chasing that ball and immediately jump into the road. So I just slow down. But what about artificial intelligence? Can we code all those behaviors? Can it learn all of those human reflexes without it? And uh, we need to also, there's the unfortunate reference of previous accidents by uh, autonomous cars. So we have a, a again, unfortunate uh, statistics based on our tests. We didn't sell any cars. We don't have thousands of uh, test cars, but in, two, in, in between 2019 and 2020, there was 18 accidents in 20 months, which is nearly one uh, accident per month by our test cars, which is a huge statistic because, uh, we, as I said, we don't have thousands of cars and based on our propor pro proportion, based on our scale, this is a huge statistic, huge proportion. And there was uh, other accidents by sold cars to customers. For instance, it, in China, there was an accident uh, in the highway. Highways are most suitable uh, environments for autonomous drives. It is more stable than anywhere else. And like, uh, it is more uh, safe than neighborhoods. There's no pedestrians, et cetera. And, but in that stable conditions, uh, there was a truck in laying on the road. There was an accident probably. And a Tesla car a, in the autonomous mode in the leftist uh, lane, going with a certain speed about 90 kilometers uh, an hour it just uh, the autonomous uh, drive just uh, hits the truck just laying down on the highway did not notice it did not identify that object in the middle of the road and uh, guess what the human driver was not just paying attention to the road playing with uh, his phone and he died unfortunately or there were a couple of pedestrians included cases in uh, 18 the accidents we had, three of them are pedestrian includes, includes and in the uh, Uber car accident, a pedestrian died unfortunately because of the uh, autonomous uh, driving technology. So um, we need to tell you, we, we count a lot of problems here, but we need to bring a solution to you. The solution basically reflects uh, is a pay FAT framework, which basically consists of four important elements here, which is a partnership, focus, awareness, and training. The first element we're going to start with is going to be partnership. So with partnership, we included Volvo example here, which is one of the most trustable and reputable companies companies that we could be thought that we could be in a partnership with to uh, increase the safety standards to uh, because the right to life is one of the biggest uh, fundamental right of human beings and we should guarantee that and in order to do that we need to be in a partnership with a, a trusted and reputable company like for instance Volvo in order to share experience and knowledge with them because they're currently conducting these type of researches and uh, for instance Campex is one of them they built an innovation arena to uh, gather academicians engineers or managers together to improve these type of technologies so by using uh, by uh, benefiting from those knowledge and experiences we can develop our standards because currently we don't have any automaker investor or automaker 
automaker partner, but we needed we needed to uh, develop our standards, especially safety. Right now, we're going to talk about the niche market. So if you think about Waymo, Waymo is focusing on developing a general purpose system. And then we'll think about it later where it's going to apply it, right, to the trucking or taxes. But what we are focusing on here is offering a more incremental approach, which basically means focusing on the least demanding applications in the market and focus on delivering them to the market as soon as possible. That way, Waymo will guarantee that it has an, an income stream which then it can reinvest the in earnings into continuous R&D. If that way it will decrease its exposure and vulnerability to the external funding sources. Great examples of that can be a voyage, a self-driving taxi service for villages, a privately owned retirement community. Another great example is May Mobility, which basically communicates with local governments and municipalities and creates shared fixed road shuttle services. Another one is Optimus Ride, which deals directly with private landlords and carries their tenants along with large development projects. And Neuro is basically a pizza delivery, which works within a certain territorial boundary. The common feature of all of these is the 25 mile per hour. You can see that this considerably decreases the risks of uh, regarding the right of life to be insured and interrupted. In this case, the risk of accidents also considerably diminishes. And please keep this idea in mind that all of these guarantee the fact that safety is put as a priority. Another important element that we're going to talk about now is the awareness. So uh, first, uh, we, we need to create an awareness in our customers and we need to, we ourselves need to be aware of some facts beginning with we should add, we should make an addition to artificial intelligence ethics. We need to, we mean by that is uh, we need to inform our customers, our drivers about how artificial intelligence makes decisions based on what, which crit criteria the, the artificial intelligence use. It's drivers, it's customers' right to to be in, to be know about that and we should develop our ethics codes we need to specify it to autonomous vehicles because we are currently using google's artificial intelligence conduct code or code of ethics but it's too general and shallow we need to specify it to our specific product and uh, we need to take necessary precautions during driving tests because we are testing our car, our technology, uh, open to traffic areas, and it's, it might be a little bit dangerous. So we need to be, we need, we need to make people aware of the fact that we are conducting our tests so that they can take their own precautions as well. And uh, algorithm security from interventions and individual data protection is really important because we are, as I said, we're collecting a huge data and we shouldn't be sharing those data with third parties if we are doing it as a must we need to inform our customers about whom we are sharing it who has the access to the data that that personal because it's a personal data we need to inform him to make people aware of uh, where their data goes and who can access to that and another important element is basically training. As Rabia mentioned, a lot of companies nowadays have the code of ethics, which basically describe the general guidelines about ethics. However, the code of ethics do not clearly mention on how to deal with ethical dilemmas whenever you're faced with one. So what we are offering here is basically engineers, training engineers and ethical experts on how to manage ethical dilemmas and guide them through decision-making process by focusing on ethics by design. Ethics by design basically means incorporating ethics in, throughout all stages of developing and implementing the AI systems. To train researchers, ethics experts, and programmers, we can have philosophers come in and solve particularly complex ethical questions and help companies develop their ethical strategies. In this example, we'll also would like to end it with a beautiful quote from Geneve Bell, a professor at the Australian National University, which says that the only way to think about the future in a scale is always be doing it collectively. And the notion of humans in it together is one of the ways we get to think about things that are responsible, safe, and ultimately sustainable. We draw your attention on the collectivistic approach in this case. All there are different stakeholders that need to be brought into the picture and this is one of, the, one of the reasons why we called it a constructive solution. Thank you very much for listening to us today. We'll gladly answer any questions you have in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much.
You're going to take down the, the slide share? Great. Should I stop sharing? I think it, I don't think we need to have that slide up. So yes, I think it would be great to see all of you. That That's terrific. Um, what we're going to do is begin with the questions. Uh, I'm going to put 20 minutes in and uh, we are answering in the uh, response of the board of directors. Uh, rather than a judge asking, uh, rather than a board of directors asking several questions in a row, we're going to do a round robin of, of one question at a time and then hope we can get several questions with you. I'll start with the first question. The, the number of ethical concerns that you addressed are considerable for the company. I'd like to know what you feel is the most significant thing that the company can do in response to ethical concerns. Of the things that you said, could you briefly indicate what is number one in your mind? So uh, I would, I, uh, based on our discussion and research, I would say it's a um, comprehensive, as a comprehensive solution, we should uh, take into account uh, training engineers, training designers from the beginning of the process with philosophers, with ethicists to make them internalize the ethical values we will conduct. And besides, the society will make its mind slowly and while the time passes, some uh, legal system and society will make its mind and during that process we also will be ready for the uh, future uh, legal restrictions and plus we will be all we will be already uh, responsible to society yeah. i would like to also add to that by the mind. training i mean oh, okay. to sum up Okay, I would like to maybe add a little bit to what Rabia said. Uh, as you said, it's very important to look at it as a comprehensive approach. That's what we highlighted when we talk about our solution. And it's also very important to keep it transparent. Uh, a lot of companies do not really disclose, disclose their elements of how their decision-making process is actually taking place. And when we're talking about AI algorithm, this is something that uh, simple, simply we as consumers really don't really have a clear idea about. So here, transparency and the fact that this is a collectivistic training, this is probably what is the most important in addressing the ethical issues. Thank you. Uh, let's go Fred, Thomas, and Michael. Fred? Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, when I joined the board, uh, one of the things that motivated me was the idea that uh, 1.35 million people die every year in car accidents. And I feel like uh, we've got this beautiful opportunity together to protect life by making driving safer. And I guess I, I, I want to get your thoughts on how we ought to be thinking about where we are, where we could be, and how it relates to actually what's going on today. I can jump in if Rabia doesn't mind. So in this thing, uh, we clearly believe that right now Waymo cars are on level four autonomy, which basically means that there's no need for a human driver to sit behind the driving wheel. This, uh, unfortunately, this is not guaranteeing the safety in our eyes yet, but what's ought to be, of course, we're th thinking about autonomous cars as cars that are guaranteeing safety to the passengers, to the people around us, to the fact that they might actually decrease the number of accidents that are happening because of the human factor is of course a very important detail in this case. But of course, what is ought to be is that the autonomous cars should be already out on the roads uh, by the 2021, which didn't happen unfortunately yet. But we're thinking positively about the future of autonomous cars uh, as long as the ethical parts of it are taken into account. Uh, so this, is, this will ensure that the society takes part in it too. And the way the society thinks about it will also be incorporated and reflected in how the decision-making process takes place in autonomous cars. And Rabia can comment on that as well, if she would like. And one small thing, and we couldn't uh, 
actually prove that our cars, our system is safer than human drivers because we don't have such a statistics to prove that uh, ours are safer. Yes, we are claiming to uh, design the most experienced driver of the world. That can be a future target, but that is not the case today. Based on the statistics, of course. Okay, um, here's my question. One of the things I liked about your present, the presentation to us was about the focus. Perhaps um, our board, perhaps our company tried to do too much in too short of time. Over the next three years, what aspect of the driving market should we focus upon? I can also jump in in this one uh, to start off the conversation and get it going. So we're talking about which focus of the market we should be focusing in the next three years. Is that correct? Yes. In this case, what we're suggesting is right now, Waymo is focusing on a general purpose system, which is not directly telling us on what is the target segment is. But what we are offering in this case is focusing on a particular niche as a starting point. Right. Why niche? Because that will allow and ensure that Waymo that it has a continuous investment stream and continuous earnings to be reinvested into that long-term autonomous, complete autonomous car driving project. And right now, uh, if you think about it, why the niche is a very important marketing point in this case is the fact that we want to start with a niche, we can better target what the consumers actually expect from us. What are their expectations and what are their considerations? But right now, what we're doing at Waymo is creating a general purpose system that we have not yet identified the market. But as you said, for the next three years, choosing a particular niche might be a great starting point for made Waymo. And then, of course, proceed with the R&D spendings and investments. What in niche in particular would you start on? Uh, Waymo is pretty good if we took, uh, take the statistics of the taxi drivers, right? We've mentioned the taxi Waymo one is a particularly challenging environment because it's taxi drivers, right? The autonomous, cautious autonomous car may not be as popular, right? However, if we think about it, delivering taxi service to a particular target segment, for example, in this case, uh, one of the example was the protect, providing taxi service for the villages community which is basically a privately earned retirement community, Waymo can focus on something like this, on making maybe deals with the local government's municipalities. And that way it will be able to focus on also providing tests within a particular territorial boundary. So maybe that can be one of the great examples for Waymo to start in, maybe with the particular shuttle routine, instead of taxi business, maybe shuttle routines, because taxi business is still a bit of a controversial issue in terms of how Waymo will be able to attract customers. So we can think of it as making, maybe talking to the local municipalities and governments and providing the local charge services as a starting point. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I've got a question about um, the value proposition here at Waymo. As a member of the board of directors, um, it, the technology is phenomenal and it comes with all kinds of uh, moral and ethical dilemmas, but in and of it by itself, the, the technology is just phenomenal. So given that, and given the fact that we need to make a, a, a substantial investment given the size of our cost versus revenue, I'm a little unclear of the value proposition. Specifically, if a driver has to be engaged at some level among those five levels that you had mentioned earlier, why would he or she want to invest in a car like Waymo, given the fact that I'm going to have to be engaged at, at some degree whenever I get into the car? What's the, where, where's the, what's the value proposition for me? Where's the value added? Why would I want to do this? So uh, I, I want to I want to be sure if I'm getting it uh, correctly. Uh, if we are providing a uh, middle level of autonomy, why would uh, people uh, think uh, find it valuable? You're asking. Yes. Yeah. And because I'm going to be engaged anyway. It's like driving my car today. Uh -huh. A different level of engagement, certainly, but it's not completely autonomous. 
it, it provides security because uh, it, when you are when you are in human driver alone, you're alone. You have the whole control of the car. But um, although you don't want to uh, be sleepy on the wheel, you might sometimes be. You might sometimes be distracted with distracted with surroundings. What is happening around? But if we provide assistance from the car, it doesn't need to be full autonomous. Uh, it can just help you, to, it can just protect you, it can just make emergency brakes, or if you're going out of the lane, it can put you back in your lane. So these type of supports uh, actually strengthens the safety standards of the car. And as you, a little comment here as well uh, to answer Mr. Thomas's question. The fact that why should we really go for autonomous cars, right? It's the idea itself of a full autonomy is not really giving us enough trust, right? And us, we still need to get engaged in some point if there's an emergency situation, like emergency brakes. But in this case, let's think about it in this way. The autonomous cars are being de developed with the idea of better, safer world. Why better, safer world? So in this case, let's think about the human drivers. Yes, we have the necessary instincts and their eye reflection and eye contact that we can make with the other drivers. However, too often than not, most often of the times, we tend to rely on our emotional aggressive impulses. So we have a tendency to make wrong choices in emergency situations. So in emergency, to decrease that number of emergency situations happening, to increase that number of uh, like innocent people dying, the autonomous cars should be put in the roads to save as many lives as possible. Autonomous cars will not have that panicked instinctual move. That will make, they will already have a decision programmed in them according to a particular condition or circumstance. So they might be better at evalu evaluating the urgency of the situation and preventing certain accidents from happening. So here the value proposition is really safety to the car passengers, to the pedestrians and to the other cars around us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. I appreciate the number of things that you have suggested, but one thing that hasn't come up that I'm concerned about is the uh, danger of hacking in AI vehicles. And the reality is that AI vehicles are very vulnerable. And one of the consequences is that it can totally blind the system to seeing that there are pedestrians. So I'm wondering how your solution incorporates the aspect of the world we live in with hacking. In this case, uh, if you take into it, if you currently take away most website, they're really working a lot on the cybersecurity projects. Uh, you can currently see their progress on that. And they're also developing a lot of different programs that may guarantee the safety of a hacking system. But as you mentioned before, the vulnerability of it as a car, because it's an AI system, it can be hacked at some point, right? So right now, Waymo is actually already taking test steps into preventing that. They're implementing cybersecurity programs. You can also, it's also available on their website, official website. So right now they're already trying to incorporate it. And if you pay attention, for example, if you look back at our uh, solution, this comes in when we talk about awareness part. Awareness of who is gonna be making, for example, who is gonna be taking the responsibility in case of an, a hacking accident when the control is in the hands of a stranger. So in this case, uh, we'll also mention it in the awareness part that it's really important to determine how the data will be protected and whether they can be a guarantee that the hacking will not happen at any time in the future. But as you said, it's a very, very important point as well. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Um, one is it has to do with the technology versus the actual car. As Waymo, are we producing just the technology that can be added to every car that somebody wants to produce or are we making the car as well as the technology? And the question is, if that's the case, should we split the two and just produce the technology to sell to car manufacturers? Rabia, would you like to comment? Where? I can. Yeah, you can start. Yeah. If you want. We're, we're producing the technology, actually. We do not uh, produce cars. We do not manufacture. Um, I think I have a little bit of a problem with my internet. If, that yes, is, if, that, if you cannot hear me, please interrupt. Um, 
So uh, we are t uh, producing only the technology, but it is still, we're do doing it with full autonomy and with a big investment, uh, and we're not generating enough profit to sustain it. So actually we're doing much than we actually are able to do. Again, although we focus on only the technology part, it, we should, um, we should make it narrower as we uh, mentioned in the focus part. Yeah. And just one other also, comment, doesn't yeah. that, yeah. Doesn't that sure, sure, limit sure. our liability as Harry Waymo has... since we're just <laughs> providing the technology to others? The thing is when it comes to the issue of liability, it's freely subjective in the eyes of who. You see, like when it comes to liability, right? It's a very important issue from a legal standpoint, from an ethical standpoint. But when we think of it way more right now, at the very moment, it's focusing on the general purpose system. However, it has a plan to actually start developing their own cars. Why? Because the market of the self-driving autonomous cars is very, very competitive. So right now, the trouble is that even though they're focusing on self-driving general purpose system, they're also planning to have their own trucks on the roads and cars on the roads. And the issue of liability, that it, it's actually where it gets really complicated and blurry. Right now, Waymo is not really set, has not really set a clear boundary on where it's expecting to move in the next couple of years. Is it just going to be the system or is it going to be its own cars? That's the trouble with Waymo at the moment. It hasn't really clearly specified where it stands in terms of the, the technology development. So in this case, the liability issue might be very tricky and it's an important issue. But I do not think that uh, it narrows down the liability issues just because Waymo focuses on general purpose systems because they are planning to expand. But to how, how to what extent they're planning to do that is still not clear. Just a small addition to this point, and uh, we are more knowledgeable than any any stakeholder stakeholder in the market. Not not the customers are more knowledgeable than us. Not the government, states, lawmakers. We know more than all of them, and uh, until they make their minds and laws. Uh, it, we carry that responsibility because we know more things. We know everything about this technology, actually. Thank you. Brad, I think you're next. Okay, no problem. Thank you uh, for teeing me up. Um, you know, I think we're really lucky as an organization to have people who are thinking about uh, safety in, in a way where zero fatalities is our goal and what we are uh, seeking. At the same time, I just wonder uh, if we also don't have a responsibility to uh, think in a more global macro way about uh, where we are versus where we can be. And you, know, you, you talked a lot about safety and we know speed is a key factor in safety. And when you look at the statistics, at least in the United States, 45% uh, of drivers admit to driving over 10 miles an hour uh, beyond the speed limit. And I, I just feel like we've got, uh, we both have an obligation to be uh, holding ourselves to a, the, the safest standard. And we have to be weighing that against the reality of uh, the, the behavior that we've seen uh, in a, with a tremendous amount of statistics. And I think that uh, I'd like to think about how you're balancing the two and uh, with a, a healthy respect that zero fatalities is uh, the only acceptable goal, but weighing where we are versus where we wanna be and, and the acceptance of some risk on the way to a safer future. So I can just jump in here because uh, we cannot measure uh, how much people dies in which case, unfortunately. But we have some statistics uh, showing some things, but we can't uh, accurately compare those two with statistics. So we have a difference on hand in between. So if we cannot guarantee that we are safer than human drivers and human drivers are not safer than us, then we have something on hand. Uh, in human driver has the control. He or she makes 
uh, all decisions uh, consciously. So uh, he, she or he has an autonomy and takes the responsibility of getting into that action. But in the um, self-driving car, when the self-driving car does it, uh, people may uh, trust too much on the technology. People may feel safe on it and not look at the road but suddenly an avoidable accident might occur in that sense and the human uh, driver's uh, autonomy and consciousness in is not the case here so uh, an avoidable accident might occur in that sense but in the for instance drink and drivers like people might drink and drive or make over uh, over the speed limits but it's their their risk they're taking consciously so we are not doing anything to people. People make those type of mistakes in area, any area of the life as well. We cannot stop that. Yeah, I can also make like a very small comment uh, on that is when it comes to balancing, it's a really huge trade-off, right? It's there are fatalities and then there's on another part we, spectrum we have safety. Well, in this case, when it comes to technology of any sort, um, we as consumers, are in terms, in some point, we're reckless. Uh, reckless in terms of what? Uh, the recklessness comes into picture of the fact that we know that there is a, a risk of a particular consequence happening, but we take that risk anyway. Unfortunately, with the technology nowadays, that risk is implied and is already included in the decisions, whatever decision we make in the spectrum. So I just wanted to bring in uh, the light to the east, this issue of recklessness as well. The fact that this risk, uh, there is some certain risk uh, that is present regardless of the type of the car, regardless of the type of technology. And as consumers, we actually voluntarily take that risk uh, whenever we are dealing with any type of technology, unfortunately. Okay. I'd like to go back to uh, the part of the presentation that um, Nupari made mm -hmm. when you talked about the cultural differences and you gave a very good example, uh, East versus West. Mm -hmm. and how they tend to make decisions from different perspectives. So my, my question as a, as a member of the board is, how important is this as we look at rolling this product out at some point down the road? And how would you accommodate those cultural differences as it relates to decision-making in the products that we make? Would I be selling the same car in America as I sell in Thailand? Yeah, it's a very challenging and very important question. Well, uh, in the way, it really depends on the extent we're planning to expand. It really depends on what type of markets, markets we're targeting. So, for example, you've asked how important are those cultural differences and how important it is to include them, right? It really depends on the extent we are expanding as a company. Where are we ex expanding? And how far are we planning to expand? Which particular countries are we planning to take into consideration to? For example, if we're touching upon different cultures, right? If we're touching upon the markets we've never really been in contact with before, this is where those cultural values are very, very important. If we have no idea about that current market yet, what we are planning to expand into it, those particular cultural differences may make a huge difference in decision-making of the AI car. However, if we're planning to expand within the US, let's say that is just a hypothetical example. In this case, we are already familiar with the culture in the country, with the multicultural diverse environment. We are familiar with it. So here, more or less, we have a diversity within the team. We have a diversity within the company, which may actually reflect the diversity in cultural values. But if we're expanding to the markets that we have not previously contact with, for example, if we're doing it just out to see and test our cars, this is where we might be violating those cultural values. And where this is where they might be playing a very important special role in forming the AI decision-making algorithm. And when it comes to decision-making, how should we really take into account those values? That was the second part of your question, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, correct. Uh, uh, the second part, well, this is a very important part as well. We need to ensure that we take those reflections into account, but how do we actually do it? Well, in this case, one of the best ways to do it, uh, we actually paid attention to the MIT research on how they gather data around different cultural values. And it was very interesting to see that surprisingly in love, they did it through online platforms, online, online moral machine platform. Surprisingly enough, they did it online instead of communicating face-to-face. So in this case, that might be one of the options too. 
So in this case, to know better about the values of the market, to know if our values are clashing with each other to in the decision-making over the AI, we might be first actually also creating this online, let's call it as, as well, moral machine platform, where we're getting to contact, where we, for example, ask, get into contact with different types of customers, different kinds of uh, people from different countries that we're planning to expand to, and actually learn what their expectations are. This data may not be enough for us to make a particular decision, but it will give us at least a more or less of a clear idea of which direction to move into with that decision making and those cultural values and where exactly they clash uh, between each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have exceeded our, our question time, but if anyone has, if any of the uh, board members have a uh, particular issue that they wanna raise, let's, you know, let's do that. Let's just do it with word efficiency. <laughs> any, any additional questions that anyone wants to pose to the, um, the Waymo ethics team? Are we good? Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Now we have now moved into our role as us to give you feedback and we'll do that for uh, about 15 or, or, um, or so minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I want to have some time at the end. We'll excuse you with appreciation. And then I want to have some time to, to have chat briefly with the judges. So, who would like to start with the feedback? I'm happy to start. Great. Uh, so first, I, I want to thank you uh, for doing such a great job of preparing. Uh, this is it's a real pleasure to see thoughtful, super engaged young people thinking about these important issues and how they relate to business. And, and so just from the very highest level, I want to say thanks, and I think what you're doing is really important, and uh, I love uh, the way you're doing it. Uh, I also like, um, I, I liked your, your thoughtfulness, and I, I liked your presentation style. I thought you guys have uh, thought about this uh, from your perspective, and, and uh, I, I, you had a plan. Your slides were nice. You presented it in a very professional way. Uh, but what I liked most about your uh, style is that your optimism uh, and your um, and your your confidence shine through, and and I think those are two great, uh, fantastic characteristics in being young professionals. Uh, and I, I want to say uh, I th I thought that was fantastic. Uh, and with respect to the the thought exercise. Uh, I appreciated your perspective of not only a business, but some philosophy. And for, for me, living in Los Angeles, uh, being on the, the roads on a, uh, actually, to be honest, I don't, I don't own a car because I, I hated driving. So I don't even own a car. Uh, but I did drive in Los Angeles for a decade. And I have a lot less confidence in status quo <laughs> than you do. <laughs> I think that uh, you know the real the real prospective opportunity with AI is that you do definitely issue spot some of these key issues. But I think that human behavior has proven itself to not be the safest way to move. Uh, both uh, people and cargo around. And uh, I personally am looking forward to great, with the great anticipation to a more uh, um, atomic uh, perspective on transportation, because I, I think that it is what makes us human is that a lot of these dilemmas that are like you were making the argument and I thought it was very convincing that we haven't tested this in uh, uh, the circumstances that in fact it will be implemented. And I understand that. But on the flip side of that coin is that when you ask somebody the thought experiment, if they're gonna drive off the cliff or they're going, to, uh, they're going to hurt the kids in the bus, they're not driving the car and they really don't have to decide in a split second if they're gonna 
kill themselves or uh, risk the lives of the kids. So it's also impossible to test that in a way that's, uh, that, that's accurate and, and thoughtful. So I really loved this exercise and I, you're about uh, a decade ahead of where I was when I was at your age. And I think that you've got bright futures ahead of you in, in business. And I wanna take a second to laud your professor who's done a great job of preparing you uh, and who you're lucky to have the opportunity to work with. And um, that is my, my feedback on uh, your uh, work today, which is to say thank you. I think you've done yourselves and your university proud and uh, I'm grateful just to have the opportunity to be a small part of it. Thank you very much for your feedback. Thank you so much. Michael, who would like to go next? Oh, sure, I will, I will go next. I certainly agree with everything that Fred said, although I am astounded that someone who lives in Los Angeles does not have a car. That just, that's the most surprising thing I've heard all day. But seriously, I did love the presentation. I especially loved that initial graphic of the autonomous car because it allowed everyone to visualize exactly what you were talking about. Um, and then, so at, at, towards the end of the presentation, when you were talking about the legal, financial and ethical issues, it almost sounded like you did not want the board or the company to proceed with the project. You had almost talked me out of, or as a board member, us proceeding with the project. But after the Q&A, I felt a little bit more comfortable about it. Um, one of the analogies or that you have is the FPAT. And I, I would have liked to have seen um, a set of steps or recommendations that you were giving to the board. So rather than, um, as an example, rather than focusing upon everything, you could have said, well, we're gonna focus upon, I think we should start off focusing upon this aspect of the market. And once we have developed, explored, whatever this aspect of this segment, then we can go on to other segments. So in summary, I, I would have liked to have seen um, a recommendation to the board about specific recommendations to the board about what were, would be the next steps. Thanks very much, Tom. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, Rabia and Upari, uh, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, extremely well done, uh, very professional. Uh, your style and the way you presented yourself was extremely competent. We could tell that you were well prepared, certainly, and did your, did your research. Congratulations also to your professor, who um, I'm sure did a wonderful job as well. Um, I also liked your confidence. I mean, here you are talking uh, via Zoom from a foreign country to folks you've never met before, but you did a remarkable job. I'm, I'm, I'm just as amazed, certainly by the technology, but more so by the way that both of you adapted to it and were able to present the facts that you did in a very convincing manner. The, um, the only feedback I would have, and perhaps this is um, something about me, when I thought about artificial intelligence and the self-driving car, that's what I thought, that this car is gonna go around by itself and you, you know, it doesn't need anybody there. Maybe the person is in the car as a passenger and that's it. So that might have been more on me than on you. So given that, I would go back to my comment earlier about maybe focusing in a little bit, perhaps early on, about the value proposition. Fred mentioned that there was uh, a million three lives that happened because of auto accidents. Maybe a discussion about how we can mitigate this. And not only where we are today in the infancy, but down the road as we stretch this thing out, how the value proposition will change, how it will become more safe. But given all of that, I, I do think that you made um, an excellent presentation. 
uh, the, the slides added to it, they were easy to follow. And uh, I, the one about the five stages at the beginning was, was really exemplary. So thank you so much for the hard work that you've done. Very, very impressive. Thank you also for participating. Thanks very much. The judges gave, I hope you feel wonderful feedback. I'm gonna focus particularly on what as is that I think you need to consider in your 10 minute and in your 90 second. I think that certainly when it comes to presence, when it comes to, to the fundamentals of, of competency and, and confidence, you all are terrific. Keep in mind that your role is to influence and persuade. Michael's comment, I think, was a very good one. I was also having trouble understanding where you stood. And part of that, I think, is for me, you seemed like outsiders. Instead of being the Waymo ethics team, you talked about their, their website, their this. And I think it's really important to talk about our, because that's who you are. You're, you're, when you come back, <coughs> you're still selling to the board of directors. So I think that's really important. Um, I think it would have been helpful if we had understood the distinction between what Waymo was doing and what you're recommending that in the ethics area that is particularly um, different and significant and, and why in a 10 minute time with them, you're going to need to really shorten the ethics piece to the clarity around either selling the system or as Tom, uh, I believe suggested, or uh, it was Michael, a set of recommendations, a set of being clear about, and this is wonderful practice for the future, which is part of how and why uh, IBEC does what it does. We want you to be able to have the sense of understanding how you present ethical, how you present ethical solutions and challenges to decision makers um, until you become a decision maker yourself in the evolution of, of your career. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So I'm not sure how you best might want to do that, but you've got 10 minutes. And so you might want to consider a brief statement about what the gap is between what is already being done at Waymo and, and what it is that you are particularly talking about. And if you are going to sell your system and that's what you want to spend your 20 minutes on, then do it in a way that allows the board to see, as, as Tom pointed out, value on a number of levels. And we're not just talking obviously about financial here. Uh, or as Michael suggested, be able to talk about what it is that is the most important for the shift and the change to be. You won't get to see your wonderful slides. That isn't going to be part of what you can bring into the, um, into the presentation. And you did a wonderful job of of you know, setting things up. Um, when it comes to the 92nd, what really matters is that you follow the directions. So many times teams have gone off on, on other kinds of things without necessarily taking to heart that you're playing a role as an employee trying to address other employees about the importance of what it is you're trying to talk about which is not news to you, but I just, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, that you will be following, um, however you handle the 90 seconds, you have a brief amount of time to make, again, instead of persuading the board, you're persuading colleagues about why this ethical issue matters. Does any of the other judges have any other comments that you'd like to make in terms of feedback to support this wonderful team who's done a really terrific job? 
Um, I would just, my other comment was, which is great is, you know, for most companies, they try and, and, and assign the liability to someone else. So in addition to, I think, training the, the engineers, I think an equal important point is that the drivers or the owners of these cars need to be trained in and understand how the system actually works. Because what you don't, what you want to sort of happen is if a Waymo car gets into an accident, it won't be the fault of Waymo, the company, it will be a fault of the operator or the owner of the car, not the technology. That's a super interesting point. And I, I think um, the reality is, is that everybody wants to get to the fifth stage. And in the fifth stage, what's really interesting is the way we think about insurance will change from it being a personal insurance issue to a commercial insurance issue. And so the reality is, is that it will take a ton of friction out of the, the system for when, when there are accidents. Uh, it won't be me against you. It, it'll be like uh, a, a commercial liability claim. Uh, and that's going to transform the, the world of insurance also, which is super interesting. But, but back to just a quick thought around framing it for your next rounds. One of the things uh, Gail's written about uh, and that I, I think is, is pretty cool is just this idea of um, uh, at, at co American company Alcoa, they had a, a business that was risky to the workers and they just said, we're not going to accept any outcome other than none of our employees die. That's the only uh, standard that's reasonable for us to hold ourselves to. And so I think that what you're really saying, and I think is very elegant, is that Waymo, as a company, that should be our standard, is that we're not going to hurt anybody, that we're going to protect everybody. And on our road to get there, we have to think about how to do that in the, in the most thoughtful way. And what you're laying out is a roadmap to get there. But I think the there, that's the big, uh, audacious, bold thing is that we want to work at a company that allows people to move around without injury or death. And that that is the only standard we're going to accept. I think that's a super powerful way of reframing what I, I, I believe you were trying to say. Um, Ankara and um, our, our uh, rabbi, uh, Rabi, Ra I'm sorry. Rabia. Uh, yeah. Rabia, thank you. I apologize. Do you have any um, questions of us in the in the few minutes that we have left? That that I I, I actually have, but that might be a little bit general question. Um, so in the solution part, sometimes we can uh, raise some concerns about some ethical issues, but a uh, solution uh, can be a collaborative issue with uh, the finance department, with marketing, with all the dimensions in the company. Maybe creating a solution, aggregate solution would be better just uh, because we two ethics person suggesting something and we don't know all the financial issues. We don't know all the other parameters. That would be, again, I think, uh, in which doesn't matter which solution we bring out, that would be um, still shallow. I mean, uh, do you get what I mean by that? I think you're talking about the need for collaboration. So part yeah. of what you might suggest in your solution, and it gets to a culture issue, which is something that I think Fred was, uh, was really the underpinning of that. You have a chance as the ethics team to be helping shape a culture of safety. More importantly, in order to accomplish that, the culture is of the whole company can't be siloed. So I think that didn't have a chance to come out in your um, presentation, but I think when you're talking about 10 minutes, it's going to be powerful to focus on the, the sort of nadir of this which um, sadly they won't hear all the wonderful details and you know everything else that you've done, but you've got a significant job and culture 
and ethics are tied as as we we all know to the value um so try to try to think about that and i think that the suggestions about what it is you choose to say in that brief amount of time need to get at demonstrable absolute kinds of connections back to ethics and and safety as you've already identified that that's the value statement clearly yeah thank you can would you mind if i ask you one more question please uh, it was regarding the actually the 10 minute presentation just to make sure that we are actually following the guidelines because uh, there are sometimes some misunderstandings happening. So for our 10 minute pre pre presentation, are we allowed to use PowerPoint slides or no. not? No, okay. unfortunately just not. Wanted, just wanted to nope. make sure so that we, yep. we follow everything. There's no Thank slides you. and there's no video. Um, okay, so it's just... You. Just you, are you both gonna do it together and share it or is one of you gonna do it or how is that working? We're gonna do it together. Okay, great. I think that you've just, it's so evident of how much time and care that you have put into this presentation. And I think we owe you a applause. Hey. <laughs> no, and I really learned a lot. I know so much more about the whole driverless technology, about the issues involved. You definitely educated me through your presentation. And I think that is so valuable that myself, and I'm not going to speak for the rest of my colleagues, but I hope too, that we can walk away so much more knowledgeable than when we started when it came to Waymo and the technology. So I appreciate your teaching me. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us today. We wish you great luck in your 10 minute and in your 90 second. And Sabrina- to if hear that. And um, it was great, great to see you again, Professor. Um, you, you do a wonderful job with your teams. And with that, I'll ask Sabrina to, to uh, just leave me with the judges. So thank you very, very much. And all good luck. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable feedback. Thank Please you so take much care. for your valuable feedback. <laughs> stay, stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, in just a moment, I will open up a breakout room for just the judges. Um, Thank give you me very one much. moment, and we should move you over there. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe it should just be you. Um, feel free to discuss. Thank you very much. All right, um, we're, we lost Michael. Sabrina, we need Michael back. Just a moment. He, I believe, actually left the meeting. So we'll give him a second to see if he'll jump back on. <laughs> I think he left in the in the process. Um, let's let's just, see what is, we can is, do here. Yeah. If if you can, if there's a way of you tracking him down, that's great. Otherwise, um, I'll start with uh, I'll start with um, the great judges that I have here. Thank you. Um, Tom and Fred, you you're your uh, experts at this. I just want to, oh, good, Michael's back. Excellent. Yeah. Terrific. Oh, and it, it's a new background, Michael. Thank you very much. I feel oh. like I've, I've traveled farther. Excellent. Is, is, is that Segovia? It is Segovia, yes. Good wow. morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, goodness. It's a so pleasure to, to be with uh, three such uh, experienced uh, Judges, your questions were great. Do you have any questions about what needs to happen next? Uh, you know that uh, you'll need to go on the online form and, and provide all of that. And I'll get that feedback um, from you over the weekend from Tom, which is helpful to me in, in making my decision. But I just wanted to have a chance for any of us to just sort of talk and what your thoughts were, um, you know, bottom line about the the proposal, how you felt it, it stacked up to what you thought it needed to be. That would be helpful for me as I'm thinking through my stuff. Well, I just think I of the very, 
at, at the very highest level, I just think it's so inspiring to see three women uh, sitting in the capital of Turkey uh, and just delivering a very thoughtful, high quality ethics based presentation uh, to some people sitting around the world. Just the 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 fact that this uh, competition is able to do that at the very highest level makes it just uh, amazing. And so I just, you know, like Michael was talking about just the pure educational, but for me, it's just uplifting, right? It's just, it made me feel good uh, to know this is happening and that, that uh, th those are three formidable people that are making the world a better place. Uh, that, that's just the headline for me. I would agree. I, part of the, uh, uh, as Michael said, part of it was being educated about this whole AI thing. Um, but just listening to those young women, uh, the world is a much better place for me today than it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. They are remarkable. And it's just a, sh just a great, great feeling to be part of something like this, where they get a chance from Ankara, Turkey to showcase just how good they are. I, I couldn't be happier and more pleased with their presentation. And, and you know what I always say, since I've, I've participated in a number of competitions, and you know how if you ever have kids, you always tell a six-year-old, well, everybody is a winner in the competition or so. <laughs> I really feel that way about this ethics competition, because regardless of whether the team wins or not, the process of preparing the presentation, the process of giving it, of answering questions on the fly, that makes you, makes the team a winner, regardless of whether they actually come away with the trophy or not. You know, everybody really is a winner in that case. Um, and I also think when you are given this assignment, the next time they're asked to make a presentation to an audience, they'll keep more in mind about the audience who they are addressing and the role they are taking in it. Um, Gail, I thought it was a very good point about their moving back and forth between the roles. Um, and they really need to be a Waymo ethics person and say, and also I think it's always better to be sort of more specific than more general. Yes. So if I had my, if, if I was going to make a recommendation, I would have said definitely spend um, a third of the time on educating what is the technology, a third of the time on the issues, the actual ethical issues, and then a third of the time perhaps on the recommendations or next steps that the board needed to take. Yeah. I agree. I did not think from a, um, and there was no point as it's not going to, as the 30 second, as the 30 minute isn't, you know, going to be judged again. There was no point, I didn't think, in really going into that, but you're so right. I think that one of the challenges is I struggled. I don't know about the rest of you, but I struggled to get to the point of what was new and what is something the company is already doing and what's the gap? And none of that was there that, um, you know, made it easy easier for us to follow, I felt. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a, a real deterrent, I think, in the future if, um, but they come back every year and every team is different. This is probably the fifth um, um, METU I've heard and, and they have a great faculty advisor and it's hard to do this, but. <laughs> Well, risk analysis is, is, is difficult for individuals to begin with. And, you know, I mean, the reality is, is that what, what we heard is not dissimilar uh, to what we're hearing in, in our own newspapers today uh, about uh, the J&J &J vaccine, right? Yeah. So, you know, we've had seven, um, perhaps we're not sure, side effects with respect to this blood clotting. And uh, out of about 6 million uh, successful vaccinations, and yet we've decided to, to take a pause 
And with that pause comes all kinds of other uh, ramifications. But, you know, we think that we're doing it in an abundance of caution uh, in the same way that I think generally people look at AI and they're, they're poking holes in the uh, exceptions uh, rather than the big picture, which is we've got millions of awful drivers out there who aren't paying attention now, uh, endangering uh, lives. And uh, we're accepting it as some form of uh, self-reliance or status quo, it's just simply unacceptable. And so, I mean, it's these are hard things. I mean, to it, it's not, you know, it's not easy regardless of where you are, what your experiences have been, uh, what you've studied, it's complicated. I think you're right. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's the, not only, it, that's the big ethics issue. And Fred, you mentioned it, there are 1.3 million people killed a lot of that can be prevented, hopefully, by uh, the AI right. car. And I, I, I would have led with that. I would have said, here's, what we're, here's why we're here. There are 1.3 million I, people dead. It's a huge ethical problem. I and agree. here's what we're going to do about it. That I tried to bring them to it a couple times, uh, but that's my perspective is, yeah, yeah, we're the most ethical company on the planet. We're trying to save all these lives that are needlessly being lost. Uh, that's the whole point of the company. Yes. Needless, needless being being lost because of one drunk driving, which can yep. be prevented with autonomous cars, with talking on the cell phone or uh, texting. texting which can be eliminated, road rage, which can be eliminated. So even if, if an autonomous car just addresses those three concerns, you've, you've saved many lives and saved a lot of money at the same time with just eliminating those three things. You know? Well, not to mention the number, the, the number one thing that kills people is that we drive too fast. Yes. And yes, you yes. can you Four can seconds. regulate that in the car where you can say that it's not going beyond the speed limit. Period. That's the value proposition, Tom. That is. Yeah, that's it. That's the value added. That's that's it in a nutshell. Uh-huh. And then the one other thing that just uh I'm not sure that they knew, but just for the sake of conversation amongst four uh well-intended uh volunteers is that Google owns Waymo. So uh, they're not worried about losing a uh, billion dollars a year on the prospect of having a hundred billion dollar a year business in three years. That, that's not at all a factor for them. But can, can I tell you guys one story before we leave, just, as, uh, <laughs> just uh, how the funny the way the world works? So my, my wife is an attorney and uh, she represents uh, employers around employment law issues in California. And she had a, her biggest case uh, was being heard in a San Francisco courtroom. And it was, uh, had to do with uh, a big hotel chain kind of being accused of taking advantage of uh, maids who didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. the, the reality was it was, it, it, objectively, there wasn't much damage, but from an optics point of view, it looked like the big employer being kind of mean to a susceptible uh, group of people. Now, that her case had probably zero probability of anybody ever knowing anything that happened about it. But it was in the same courtroom as the Google Waymo uh, uh, case. And what happened was the judge ended up postponing this big penultimate uh, decision between Google and Waymo. And all these legal uh, uh, trade publication reporters are sitting in the courtroom. And the next case is my <laughs> wife's case. And it ended up being on the front page of all these legal uh, publications because they were just sitting there and they, they didn't have anything to do because the judge uh, postponed the Waymo verdict. Uh, and my wife happened to be the next case. So she was on the front page of all these... Uh, legal publications out of just terrible luck for her. <laughs> I have a quick question, Fred. Is your wife your chauffeur? <laughs> well, the, 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 the reality is, is that in the pandemic, nobody needs a car because we, we didn't go anywhere. But uh, we share a car. Uh, and when I say share, I mean that I don't ever drive it. Uh, 
<laughs> and so, yeah, I, I bike, uh, use the metro, walk, Uber, uh, or sometimes bum a ride from my wife. But uh, th that's primarily how I get around the west side of L.A. <laughs> that's great. I don't know how long Sabrina can stay, so I just want to um, thank you all so much. I don't think I've ever had a chance to be with uh, such great judges. It was just terrific. So I think you're all wonderful. Um, and I really appreciate you doing this and the feedback that you gave. Um, what you will do is fill out the form with mm -hmm. great appreciation and you'll send it on to Tom and then I'll get a chance to see where you all came down on, on this. This is a tough one because we, I have three others in this class that I'm gonna be hearing today. Um, and it's hard to know, uh, you know who's gonna show up as, as the winner versus uh, the, uh, the, the runner up. But I'm with Michael, they're all champions today. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely uh, thank you so much and um all right. I just appreciate you all no yeah. problem take Bye -bye. care and fred Bye -bye. it was especially great to see you oh, thanks gail you're the best Bye -bye. i'll talk to you all Bye -bye. Bye, bye thank you again all right thank you sabrina of course thank you